Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to uh, the IISS. My name is Antoine Levesque. I'm the uh, Research Associate for South Asia here at the Institute. Um, we meet today to discuss um, India's policy towards India, towards China in general, um, but also with a particular focus on the land border issue between them and the challenges and opportunities um, this brings um, as a discrete policy uh, making area for both uh, New Delhi and Beijing. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power uh, in May this year after a resounding electoral victory. Xi Jinping has been China's president uh, now since March of last year. Both leaders uh, secured strong political mandates at home and they've set about making those mandates really work for them abroad. Um, there is plenty to say about this uh, and the Institute puts a lot of work um, in, in trying to um, assess those developments and also the, uh, and engaging the people who drive those developments. But as far as the India-China relationship is concerned, um, Asia's two largest neighbours are keen to write a new chapter in their complex relationship which traditionally has been one of uh, cooperation and competition. Prime Minister Modi and President Xi have met three times in uh, six months, which is more often um, than Modi has met with any other leader uh, during his recent uh, diplomatic blitz since he became uh, Prime Minister. In September, Xi and Modi met in India for three days. It was a very successful visit. They vowed to revive plattering um, trade, and China pledged $20 billion uh, of inward investment uh, for India by 2019. Yet only a thousand kilometers or so away, um, a face-off took place between several hundreds of um, soldiers on either side of the border. Um, and this highlighted um, once again, as has been the case for several decades now, that the border is disputed and undemarcated. And the, the face-off um, on that occasion threatened to overshadow the leaders' um, diplomatic um, success during, the, comp during the, the visit. Significantly, the incident occurred despite India and China having reached a border defence cooperation agreement um, only a, a year or so ago. So why should we sitting in London be thinking about those issues? I think there are two basic reasons. The first one is that um, the India-China relationship, especially its trade and investment aspect, matters to the global economy as a whole. And I'm thinking here of the border issue um, more in terms of its political um, opportunity cost for the relationship, maybe even an irritant, um, hampering the relationship's potential. The second um, reason, um, and that is perhaps a little more profound, is that I, I believe there remains a risk of misunderstanding, perhaps miscalculation, which could, uh, in absence of a resolution of a dispute in the near, um, in the near or medium term, um, result in um, a border being more uh, prone to crises um, uh, and, and therefore being a, a danger for the wider relationship. Today, uh, we have a, uh, a great speaker to tackle those issues with us. Um, Manoj is um, a distinguished fellow at the ORF in New Delhi, one of um, India's leading think tanks. Um, during his three decade long career in journalism, he has worked for uh, pretty much every single um, uh, big um, uh, daily and some of the weeklies um, in, in India. Um, until recently, he was member of the Indian um, government's task force on national security and a member of the National Security Advisory Board. On this note, um, let me stop here um, to leave plenty of time for the conversation. Uh, before I hand over the floor to you, um, let me just remind you all that this is on the record. Um, and Manoj will be speaking for 25, 30 minutes, um, and following which we'll have uh, what I hope will be a very lively conversation. Manoj, over to you. Thank you, Antoine, and uh, 
thanks to the IISS uh, giving me this opportunity. I've been here once before, but I don't remember exactly when, <laughs> but that's the problem of function of age. Uh, but um, it's a lovely backdrop. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak at this great institution. So what I'm going to do is that this lecture, essentially I had uh, done it in two parts. And uh, now it's what's happened is the Arundel House uh, Wi-Fi is, <laughs> is intruding into my... Uh, So, uh, as I said, this is in two parts, but I'll focus on the land border issue. And if I have time, I'll just refer to the maritime, the new emerging maritime uh, issues and the strategic uh, level issues with relation to nuclear uh, weapons. But that, if I only if I have time. Now, coming to the border issue, when on April 15, 2013, the PLA established an isolated camp of five tents, uh, 19 kilometers inside what India considered the LAC and the Depsang Plains, it was a bit of a surprise uh, and set off a train of events which have compelled us to re-examine the issue of the border and its role in the Sino-Indian relationship, which of course goes much beyond the border. Uh, the end of the three-week standoff uh, in May was as sudden as was its beginning. And the reason why we could terminate the Depsang incident uh, successfully was that we threatened to call off Lee Keqiang's May 18th visit. In April 15, this happened. So in uh, early May, we told the Chinese that you know you can't, your prime minister can't possibly come here if this is going to. Uh, so they called it off. So this time the PLA was smarter. What they did was that they chose their demonstration during Mr. Xi Jinping's visit. So while Xi Jinping was visiting New Delhi, uh, the PLA was uh, was trying to intrude into an area which we consider uh, ours and in considerable strength. And the Indian Army was ordered to face them off. So they, they and. These are things which are a puzzle to me because you know that area in Chumur, uh, that is uh, in southern Ladakh, is an area which is uh, favorable to India, meaning in terms of logistics. And yet the PLA uh, sought to come in out there. Of course, the key lesson, uh, the 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 uh, this incident, the second incident, along with the last year's incident, confirmed. Uh, at least to me, that there was no action, there was no rogue PLA unit which is doing all this. But it was an essential part of Beijing's signaling strategy. Now you can say what the signals were, that's something which we can examine. The key lesson in all this, of course, uh, is that unsettled borders can never be peaceful ones. Because there's a long time assumption that, you know, this uh, border may be unsettled, but we have CBMs, etc., and so we can carry on, but uh, the, the, the one such a minor incident like someone setting up five tents creates an, uh, a, 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 an international um, uh, discord. Uh, obviously, there's a problem. Now, over the years, both India and China have increased their presence up to what they consider the line of actual control. The Chinese did this before us because, and because they have a huge terrain and resource and climate advantage, we are only trying to play catch up. The terrain is such that the flat Tibet, uh, Tibetan plateau much easier to build roads uh, out there, not much rain, whereas on our side is the Himalayan, uh, uh, the very weak Himalayan mountains, prone to landslide, very, very excruciatingly difficult. I come from one of those regions, and so uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, it's an extremely painful area uh, to work in. And as I said, the Chinese had had improved their uh, their uh, logistics in an incredible manner. They built a railroad, which is now touching the Indian border uh, coming closer, touching the Nepal border, and then th there are plans to bring it uh, closer to the Indian border. Uh, now the 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 uh, the Chinese the, uh, the, the, the the this time in 2011 they have suggested that the two si two sides sign a border defense cooperation agreement, and as part of this they said why don't we freeze everything? So we told them we can't freeze everything because you've got a 10 year advantage on us. And in any case, uh, subsequently, the Border Defense Cooperation Agreement was signed without any commitment to uh, freezing. Now, over the last 10 years, India has been improving roads, using the Indo-Tibetan border police and army in, in the place of uh, intelligence bureau parties. The basic patrolling limits, which were drawn up in 1976, uh, were first set up, have been revised. And uh, we have changed the frequency and size of the patrols and their performance has improved. 
But what we haven't changed is our concept of the line which we first established in 1976. 1976 was the first time after the 1962 war that we actually got down saying now where is this LAC and we uh, we uh, uh, we have to understand that you know the, uh, the, the, the the important thing is to ask is has there been any change of pattern now in the case of Depsang you see a change the patrolling was going on and the Chinese main base in that area is just you know half an hour away but the very fact that they pitched tents there was a change of pattern but at the broad level across the LAC, actually there has not been much of a change of pattern. We have to understand that neither of us were at points that we call the LAC after 1962. The Chinese pulled back 20 kilometers. Uh, we were even further back. We had been defeated and we, we, we were much further back. The nature of the border of course has changed and now there is more uh, logistics, uh, better reconnaissance. In the old days we didn't even know what was on the other side of the mountain. Uh, now you have satellite imagery and, and uh, other kinds of stuff. Plus, Tibet is relatively open. Uh, many Indians take a visa. You can go to Lhasa, catch a, uh, a SUV and go all the way to the Mansarovar, uh, Kailash Mansarovar site of pilgrimage. So it's a, it's a different kind of a border in some ways. I just want to look at, uh, cast a deeper look at the border issue. Now we began approximately at the same time in 1950 as we were a sovereign democratic republic and the Chinese as the People's Republic and when India became a republic in 1950 we published a white paper on states and there was a map accompanying it and the eastern boundary of Jammu and Kashmir was actually marked as border undefined it is a fact that it was marked as border undefined in 1953 a decision was taken uh, to draw a hard line where that undefined had been written now we still don't know because the archives on that are closed but I think it was a, it was an, uh, a, a negotiating position uh, on our side in 1954 all the maps were withdrawn and replaced with new ones which showed the international borders as we see them now but of course this was done unilaterally and not through negotiations and so that it helped it, it precipitated a crisis the Indian view was that this was a traditional and customary boundary and did not require any confirmation as for the East India believes that the Himalayan watershed represents the uh, uh, boundary. This is as we well know marked by something called the McMahon line uh, which resulted from the Simla Accord of 1914 which the Chinese dispute since their representative merely initialed the document he did not sign it. The two countries have made several efforts to resolve their border dispute through dialogue. After the war in 1962 the threads were only picked up in 1981 when they had a series of eight rounds of senior level talks between 1981 and 1987. In 1988, after a breakthrough visit by uh, Rajiv Gandhi, the return visit of uh, Zhao Lai's uh, 1960 visit, talks were undertaken by a joint working group, which comprised of the respective foreign secretaries and their delegation. Between 88 and 2002, 14 meetings of this joint working group took place. But basically it was uh, you know, kind of saying uh, this is the map that I have and this is the map you have and, and kind of uh, going back and forth not going anywhere. But what the major uh, JWG did manage to do was to put a major CBMs in place so there would be no inadvertent clash and towards that end there was a 1993 uh, agreement on maintaining peace and tranquility uh, which is very important because it actually, it actually, uh, uh, it actually uh, it actually brought in the concept of uh, of uh, I'm sorry. What's happening is that the 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 Arundel uh, Wi-Fi is capturing my <laughs> system, and, and uh, yeah. So the the so 93 agreement was very important because it brought in the concept of mutual and equal security. Both sides said, "Let's uh, have mutual and equal security, so we will eventually thin our forces." we will take away heavy weaponry etc uh, from out here but they also said that they would clarify the line of actual control because it was impossible it's impossible to have any kind of a peace and tranquility tranquility agreement unless both sides agree where the line of control actually lies and there is really no agreement uh, up to now this 93 agreement is the mother agreement from what all the others have uh, emerged now by and large, the two sides have maintained peace and tranquility on the LAC. But as I said, been very, uh, there hasn't been much 
progress in trying to pin down an accepted, mutually accepted version of where the line of actual control uh, lies. Now this process of trying to uh, continue till the 2000s and then it was given up, you see. The, uh, then I will explain uh, the two sides decided to kick this process up and uh, create two political uh, special representatives uh, to negotiate this border. Now this happened since the 2000s, the quickening pace of the Indian economy began to change the perception of India in the global stage and the Sino-Indian interaction began to move on two tracks. This was manifested by Prime Minister Vajpayee's uh, visit to Beijing in 2003. Here the two sides agreed that there was need for some political direction to the talks and they decided to appoint special representatives who would lead the process. As a measure of the importance India attached to the process, the PM decided to appoint his own principal secretary, the most important official uh, in his office, as his special representative. And uh, the Chinese side appointed Dai Bingwu, who is a senior politician and diplomat, whose effective job was as kind of a national security advisor to uh, President Hu Jintao. Now the SR talks were initiated in 2003, and actually I subsequently asked Rajesh Mishra uh, in 2007, uh, that my impression, because I was there in that uh, visit, my impression was that India and China intended to settle this very fast, uh, the border. And he said, yes, he said, we would have settled it in two years. But then Prime Minister Vajpayee lost the 2004 election. <clears throat> and as a measure of the progress uh, that be, uh, took place immediately was that in 2005, the two sides signed an agreement on the political parameters and guiding principles for the settlement of the India-China border question. Now this is very interesting. The, 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 uh, this agreement uh, had various uh, uh, clauses. It virtually spelt out the contours of a border settlement according to me. Because if you look at, uh, and basically it was on the mutual, mutual uh, exchange of claims. The Chinese would keep Aksai Chin and the Indians would keep uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Article 4 of the agreement noted, the two sides will give due consideration to each other's strategic and reasonable interests. Now to my mind this appears like Aksai Chin, which means we take into account uh, strategic interests. Article 7 said, in reaching a boundary settlement, the two sides shall safeguard the due interests of their settled population in border areas. To my mind this looks like Arunachal Pradesh, settled populations. So this was Article 4 and Article 7 indicated that they were signaling that they were ready to do a swap. And mind you, the swap had been offered by Zhao Enlai in 19, uh, 1960 and Deng Xiaoping in 1981. Uh, the Indians in their foolishness turned it down uh, in, in both the occasions. And now here again we see the swap idea uh, surfacing. Now in the 16th round, see the, 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 the uh, subsequently we found that the Yang Jichei, who was the foreign minister, uh, this is after, uh, I put it approximately to the Indo-US nuclear agreement. I think the Chinese were not very happy with that. And so they began to resile from their commitments to this and Yang Jichei uh, told one of our, uh, our foreign minister at that time, uh, Pranab Mukherjee, uh, that settled population doesn't really mean uh, Tawang. And since then the Chinese have been insisting that India return Tawang. India would give up Tawang, the Tawang tract, uh, as a precondition to the settlement. Now, Tawang is the most important town in Arunachal Pradesh, and it's the site of a major monastery. And basically, what we tell the Chinese is, the moment you say Tawang, it means you don't want an agreement. And that's where uh, it lies. Now, in the 16th round of the talks, which was in uh, 2013, the Chinese special representative was the same Yang Jichei who had been kicked upstairs, meaning from foreign minister he had become the uh, become the uh, uh, become the special representative. Uh, they actually the two sides uh, worked out a document which said what are the common principles that we have uh, th that we have uh, agreed upon. Same problem has occurred again. So they said, what are the common uh, uh, areas of common agreement the two sides have achieved? Now, according to an article in an Indian daily last year, uh, <coughs> the then Chinese uh, ambassador Wei Wei, who has since been purged from Delhi, I don't know where he, no one knows where, why he was withdrawn suddenly. <laughs> but Wei Wei said that the two sides have arrived at an 18-point consensus 
on uh, this border settlement. Now, at the start of the 16th round, uh, Yang Jiche himself said that, you know, we must break new ground, strive for a settlement on the China-India border boundary question. The 17th round took place in February this year, and the dialogue took place for some eight hours, out of which two and a half were devoted to the border issue. There, of course, now the special representatives deal with the entire gamut of the relationship. So they also deal with, with the main, uh, maintenance of peace and tranquility, bilateral relations, regional and global issues, strategic issues, uh, and other things. So this, this, uh, the SRs are now uh, looking after the entire relationship. Now the two sides are trying to work, work out a framework agreement. Now it is acknowledged that the stage of arriving at the framework is the most complex, because once you have the framework, this will be the key agreement which will translate into a borderline. The third stage will of course be the actual delineation of the uh, border. Now as we've noted that Weiwei said that there's an 18 point consensus, you see. And I think both sides have put up their frameworks, they've looked at it, uh, but they haven't come, uh, gone back to each other because now we have a new uh, SR, uh, that is the, our National Security Advisor, he was only appointed uh, earlier this month. Now the, the second track, I said the one track was the SR process, the second track was confidence building measures uh, at the military level. So as part of this, in April 2005, we had signed a protocol on the modalities for the implementation of CBMs in the military field. They set up uh, standard operating procedures, and which are quite interesting because what happens is when the two patrols meet, and they infrequently meet, uh, they up, put up a first a banner. They are carrying a banner, and they said, "This is Indian territory or Chinese. This is Chinese territory." And then uh, the second banner, they say. Uh, turn around and go back to your side. Now you see these are the incidents which often get reported in the media and people call people call them face-offs. But you know, face-off is quite different from uh, the thing because th th these are very well choreographed kind of um, uh, uh, events. In 2006, the two defense ministries of the two sides have signed an MOU on exchanges. So now we've begun the process of exchanges, uh, exercises. And then, as I said, the Border Defense Cooperation Agreement, which in incidentally, in which is often not noticed, uh, the Border Defense Cooperation Agreement was signed by a PLA Lieutenant General and the Indian Defense Secretary. Because the Chinese system works differently, uh, it's important to have the PLA on board on, on, on these kind of uh, measures. Because we need to point out, you know, the LAC is very different from the line of control. Often, especially in the Indian media, people translate, uh, uh, transpose the two. The line of control with Pakistan is a lethal area where there's lots of firing going on, incursion attempts, uh, smuggling, drug smuggling, uh, all kinds of things are happening on the line of con uh, control. Whereas the LAC is a fairly peaceable kind of an area. I think it's one of the most peaceable borders and the last death by accident was in 1975 and the last bullet fired was in 1967. But we tend to be lazy about labeling and we talk of intrusions in the same context as we speak of the LOC. Now the Chinese actions, you know, I think if you try to analyze them, you can see them probably at two levels. Uh, one is where the Chinese side keep on nibbling at Indian territory and try to create new facts on the ground. Now this is actually, uh, the, you know, what you call salami slicing tactics because if you look at the Chinese claim of the uh, in the Aksai Chin area, you find that the uh, the entire uh, the the uh, earlier in 1956, the Chinese accepted that the entire Chipchap and Galwan River, Galwan River valleys were accepted as being as Indian territory. But in 1960, China insisted that these were within their claim line, and in 1962, they actually occupied them. So there was a shift, and the Depsang thing was a further westward movement. To what end? I don't know. I'm on, uh, I will not be able to uh, tell. At another level, the Chinese were expressing unhappiness over India's military buildup on the Sino-Indian border, because which I said was has a lag of 10 years, so we are now trying to catch up. In the last five years, India has activated forward airfields in Ladakh, important, completed important road building projects, uh, moved high performance aircraft. Uh, in addition, we've raised two new mountain divisions. We plan to establish two armored brigades across the Himalaya and we are raising a new mountain strike corps, which means the Indian army will have the capacity to launch an offensive uh, into, uh, into Tibet.
the uh, and then in addition to this there have been ch changes in the strategic level meaning india has is perfected the uh, is, is perfected the agni 4 uh, long range missile and is working with the agni 5 and the launch of its strategic ballistic missile submarine so looked at from the chinese point of view if you face a country with whom you have a disputed border you'd be unhappy about its growing military profile never mind that your own infrastructure and military build up have outpaced that of india by about a decade and a half in this period china has developed a railway as well as a road network in tibet in addition it has deployed powerful forces which include uh, rocket uh, armor rocket artillery and battlefield support missiles uh, i'm going to now wind down towards the close on this uh, by talking about the recent indications of a changed environment xi jinping's visit Uh, Xi Jinping's March 27, 2013, in Durban, Xi Jinping, when he had just he had taken over in November 2012, but in March 2013, uh, just after he became president, he announced that uh, China and India should improve and make good use of the mechanism of special representatives to strive for a fair, rational solution uh, framework acceptable to both sides as soon as possible. Now, this was interesting because you know. Uh, even earlier china had spoken of a fair rational solution etc but the chinese leader for the first time said use the word, phrase as soon as possible that is one uh, this thing and this has been repeated since li keqiang in may 2013 expressed the same kind of sentiment wang yi when he came to delhi uh, in june this year as a chinese foreign minister uh, he came after mr modi was elected prime minister He said, "Through years of negotiations, we have come to an agreement on the basics of a boundary agreement. We are prepared to reach a final settlement." Very absolutely uh, clear statement. Now, despite the problems arising out of the confrontation that what took place during Xi Jinping's visit, uh, the two sides, you know, uh, actually in the joint statement which I checked up uh, during Xi Jinping's visit, said very clearly, recalling the agreement on the political parameters and guiding principles. for the which was signed in 2005 both sides reiterated their commitment to an early settlement of the boundary question and expressed their conviction that this will advance the basic interests of the two countries and therefore be and should be pursued as a strategic objective by the two sides and xi jinping actually on the same day uh, announced uh, separately that the boundary issue should be resolved at an early date now in november 26 when uh, Mr. Dawal, our uh, NSA was appointed a special representative. The Chinese official spokeswoman uh, Hua Chunying noted that we are willing to hold a new round of special representative talks on the border issue at an appropriate time and push forward the settlement of the problem based on the principles of consensus reached by both sides in previous talks. So there is there is uh, an understanding that there is some kind of a consensus uh, between the two sides. Now the key differences, of course, are well known. China says the real problem is in the east. Now, they, as of the mid 80s, they have been saying east is the problem. India says let us settle in the west. The two sides are still negotiating, and there is more work to be done. Obviously, the Chinese position on this border has been changing over the years, as I said. You know, because earlier they used to, uh, they, uh, they twice they agreed for a swap. Uh, then, in uh, till uh, the mid 80s, Aksai Chin. was the uh, main focus after the mid 80s the east became the main focus subsequently the chinese even started calling uh, the area of arunachal pradesh as southern tibet is something very recent meaning it happened only in the 2000s uh, this happens basically what we've been telling them is that look the moment you uh, we said that that uh, that um, the moment you mention tawang it means you don't want a settlement <coughs> there also uh, certain ambiguity in china's uh, response to the jnk border which is the aksai chin border because when this official spokesperson who uh, who i mentioned earlier when she spoke of this she spoke of a sino indian border of 2000 kilometers now by our accounting it's 4000 kilometers so where are the other 2000 kilometers and is obviously what the chinese have done is that they have knocked off jnk they said this is between this is uh, separate this is had to has to do with pakistan we don't count this so 2000 we are only talking of the east but these i suspect are negotiating positions i think the what is clearly missing is on both sides is the primary political decision to settle as i said that there is a consensus the two sides know what uh, this thing i don't i think they have reached the limit to what they can uh, negotiate we know what to do and how the real issue is 
a political decision and i think political decision uh, you have to you can take your guess whether it takes place between a strong leader two strong leaders or does it take place between one weak leader and one strong leader i don't know I meaning these are the uh, experts in negotiations can uh, tell you something on this but all i can say is that as far as the the sino indian border issues concerned uh, it is uh, ripe for settlement both sides are agreed uh, on this uh, now the question is can they take the the next steps to move ahead thank you thank you manoj um for such a comprehensive and yet very detailed um account of uh, where we stand and where um the history um constrains um the policy choices as as they are today um perhaps i could ask you the first question um you um you expressed a lot of uh, optimism um about uh, a possible um about it being the right time for a resolution um to take place possibly in the next few years um i was wondering whether um, in absence of this um you could see um intermediary steps taken to strengthen the crisis management um uh, arrangement available on the border and maybe in the form of a uh, follow up to the border um agreement which was reached last year Well, I think you know uh, uh, you're right. Both sides also understand that. In fact, the, what the Chinese have done is just like they have done in the South China Sea area, uh, is that in the last round of the special representative talks, uh, they actually proposed the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. They said, "Let's now do one more step, meaning after the border defence cooperation agreement, let's work out a code of conduct." You see, so this incrementally, yes, all this is possible. incrementally so all this is possible uh, including as i said the other issues you know exchanges between india and the pla uh, senior officers getting to know each other uh, naval uh, you know uh, visits to each other's uh, countries so all these are part of that uh, process but one is left wondering whether would you like to first clarify the lac and then negotiate the final because you know till 2005 2000 till 2000 everyone thought that the way to go was to let's at least get an understanding a mutual understanding of where the line of actual control lies then in 2000 there was a sudden shift and uh, special representative uh, representatives were appointed saying you know the hell with that let's move and settle this thing now till 2005 we thought we were moving pretty fast 2005 comes the break and as i said my suspicion is it has to do with the india's relations with the united states uh, but that agreement that far reaching agreement and then we are now again slowly negotiating and we have again uh, picked up steam since 2009 2010 now we have uh, as i said got a consensus on in 18 areas there's a consensus for a framework i don't know how it works we need to we say should it be uh, should it be watersheds should it be a particular date you know all these these, these are issues uh, i think Uh, i think most of what what our negotiators at least say is the question of the political part of it mm. if mr xi jinping but of course we also understand after all our prime minister has to answer to parliament and there will uh, be no doubt because you've been telling the people that you know this border is immutable but as i explained to you this border was drawn unilaterally in upside chin and you'll have to go to the people and tell them well you know uh, there's a, a bit of a problem and uh, this is what happened likewise mr xi jinping has to go to his central committee or politburo or politburo colleagues uh, he'll have to take them along so both sides have to expend political capital on this great thank you um the floor is now open mm -hmm. um the first person to catch my eye was nigel nigel inkster Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Nigel Inks, the director of uh, transnational threats and political risk uh, here at IISS. Um, you know, th th this is not a, an issue that is you know, clearly directly linked to to the border negotiations, but uh, you know, I, I, I you know, uh, suspect it is a major conditioning factor in the overall relationship, and that is the whole question of the Dalai Lama and the the, the, the politics around that. um where recently there was some intimation that uh, you know, there there were indications of a potential rapprochement between China and the Dalai Lama which doesn't seem to have gone anywhere 
everyone knows that the Dalai Lama is not going to be around forever and there is an immensely complicated maneuvering around what happens uh, after, his, uh, after his demise. I wonder if you could uh, offer any thoughts on, on how that uh, impacts on the issue. Well, you know, uh, as far as the Dalai Lama is concerned, I think no matter what happens, uh, the Chinese will come up with their Dalai Lama when he passes away. Mm -hmm. Because the Chinese have always maintained a historical understanding that the Dalai Lama must be approved by Beijing. So the Chinese have an imperial understanding of this. You see, so the Dalai Lama was approved by the emperor, and so now the new emperor in Beijing will uh, have to approve of, of the Dalai Lama. So the Chinese will come up with their Dalai Lama, and he'll be installed in Potala if it's Dalai Lama. Now the question is, and this is theological really more than anything else, what if the Dalai Lama says, I refuse to reincarnate? You see? You have to look at it in the context of Tibetan uh, uh, Lama Buddhism. You can, as a uh, person who's so evolved, uh, say, "I'm not going to reincarnate." He's so, so uh, you know, so I, 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 this is a, this is a complicated thing. But I can tell you that the uh, they will if if the Dalai Lama is found in California or Mysore or mm. or Dharamsala or something like that, there will also be another like you have two karmapas. You see now. Purely accidentally, both Karmapas are hanging around in India, which is creating a, uh, creating a lot of uh, problems. And uh, my wife used to represent one of them uh, as a lawyer. So it's a, it's a legal issue because I've got lots of property and uh, and, and things like that. But uh, I think uh, the, from the political point of view, Tibet continues to be a major headache for China. And I think in 2008, when the Olympics took place, the Chinese were surprised by the extent of protests that took place and the protest did not take place in the Tibetan autonomous region in Tar. They took place in what we call Greater Tibet, meaning in Sichuan, Gansu and uh, other provinces, which meant that populations which had been under uh, uh, Chinese rule for a much longer period were even then not reconciled. I, in my, in my personal view, China has a lot to uh, work on in dealing with its minorities. I think they have the, the, and I suspect that at some point or the other, the Chinese will realize this, that, you know, that, that uh, purely uh, repression is not going to work. And at some point or the other, they have to learn. And I think sometimes you get the statements. I mean, if you look at Xi Jinping, he speaks on, uh, on Xinjiang. You often get the feeling that the Chinese leadership also realizes this, that it cannot be just uh, hard repression and that you have to reconcile. Uh, which is, you know, in the sense that uh, coming from a country like India, where I as an Indian cannot buy property in half a dozen Indian states, because the idea is to protect the ethnic uh, and cultural minority in the entire Northeast, uh, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, my own home state, Uttarakhand, all Himalayan states, that outsiders cannot buy property because you don't want to change the ethnic uh, uh, composition of the <coughs> states which is very different from China. I mean, if you look at the Xinjiang construction corps, yeah, uh, uh, they're virtually altering the, the, the um, ethnicity of the region. Now, I don't know, where, uh, but all I can say is that someone who has studied the situation, that this is something which the Chinese need to work out amongst themselves. I don't think external uh, uh, intervention is going, to, uh, is going to take us anywhere out there. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask, first of all, there's been some suggestion the new special representative is of a lower rank. He hasn't been given the same ministerial rank and he's not a sinologist like his predecessor and that the Chinese aren't happy about this. Well, is that just the Indian media blowing off or is that something that would affect the talks? And the second point is, Antoine alluded to this earlier but you didn't come to it, on a, a strategic dialogue including nuclear weapons. Um, when the special representatives meet, when the Indian officials meet, how much do they talk about nuclear weapons? I mean, there's an Indian perception now, for example, that China has dropped its no first use pledge. I mean, amongst some sectors of people who write about Chinese nuclear weapons, I think that's wrong. But I mean, how much dialogue is there between these two sides? And, and is there any possibility of, of CBMs on that side? Well, I think, you know, uh, rank is not going to really uh, affect. Because all said and done, how would you have compared State Councillor Dai Bing Wu with, uh, with uh, uh, Brijesh Mishra, Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister, National Security Advisor? Basically, 
if you just look at him as the Prime Minister's special representative, right. and there you see the Chinese government's special representative. So there are two special representatives, the duly authorized like plenipotentiary powers to uh, negotiate. So I don't think rank is an issue. Yes, the fact that Mr. Doval is not familiar with uh, negotiating uh, with China, <coughs> but as I said, that you know the issue, it's it's no longer the, meaning it's no longer an argument as to you know that in 1903 this was there and in 1947 this was this. That's not the issue. The issue is we know what the settlement has to be. The question is, are you ready for it? Uh, what are the circumstances under which we bring it, and how we can uh, that it has to be brought through politically, and so Mr. Doval has to consult. Uh, his boss and uh, Yang Jiche has to consult his boss and then work work it out. So it's a good thing that you have someone close to the PM. That's the important thing. It has to be the PM's own man. So uh, uh, and that 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 situation exists. Uh, as far as uh, nuclear weapons, you know, the Chinese refuse to discuss nuclear with us. Even amongst the special representatives, they even amongst the special representatives, yeah, we have we have not yet. Um, uh, we've discussed many issues, strategic issues, regional issues, uh, etc. But the nuclear one has not been discussed. And yes, I think it is important. I think if you look at uh, if you if you if you look at the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, nuclear force modernization, uh, whether it's the DF forty one or if you look at the the uh, anti satellite tests, etc., etc. See, right now, both China and India are committed to no first use. So, people have been fairly relaxed about uh, this issue. And they say, okay, they are NFU, we are NFU. Now, the point is that the Chinese are also benchmarking themselves against the United States. Now, what kind of a posture, uh, if the Chinese uh, want to maintain a certain posture vis-a-vis -vis the United States in the South China Sea and the East Sea uh, and in the Pacific, uh, which is basically take, ready to take on the U.S., what will be the nuclear posture? Will it still be NFU against uh, a, a, a state with the, the capability of the United States? So they are also developing, you know, the hypersonic, the WU-14, the hypersonic boost glide weapon, and etc., which means that to take on <coughs> the United States ballistic missile defense systems. Now, if the sophistication of the Chinese arsenal grows, it raises question about the survivability of the Indian arsenal. And the credibility of the Indian uh, deterrence, and certainly then it 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 puts pressure on us. As of now, we are not saying anything about it. Maybe this is an issue we need to discuss. And I think if it reaches uh, a particular stage, this will have to this will be discussed. Mr. Vinod Kumar. Thank you, uh, Member Institute. Uh, you mentioned that now the decision rests on the political line taken by the two governments and the leaders. What do you see are the constraints and incentives for both sides to actually reach an agreement or not? And perhaps you could relate that to the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the light of the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan and what's happening in that region. See, I think the uh, advantages are obvious, meaning you, you have uh, if you are able to build down conflict between India and China, uh, both of them stand to gain an enormous amount. It's not just the uh, the, the kind of saving you'd make in, in trying to uh, develop weapon systems against each other. More than that, you see, with an unsettled border, as I pointed out, even a minor incident, truly minor incident, gets inflated because of the media uh, situation and actually takes on the air of a crisis. Now, surely, uh, two large Asian countries with armed with nuclear weapons, uh, with a disputed border, can't afford to allow this destabilizing uh, situation to remain. Okay. That's one. The second thing is, of course, the uh, question of the larger economic integration of the Asian uh, economic uh, Asian uh, system, and uh, certainly there is a there is an uh, interest in India and in China. Uh, we want more. Uh, investment, we want more trade uh, with China. Because of the current uh, uh, distrust, so many, uh, India blocks out many Chinese companies from being able to invest in uh, China. China is interested in setting up high speed rail systems, they want to set up some smart cities, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, all these, uh, you know, it, it becomes so much more difficult uh, if you have 
this uh, albatross around your neck in the sense this border uh, which which tend to, uh, at any given time and often you have uh, and I must blame my own fraternity of journalists for this sometimes absolutely inventive stories come out uh, in newspapers about Chinese incursions and and, and I explained to you what incursion means in this. You know, the incursion, uh, it, it, it's very different from it, it, uh, what face off, you know, so you have newspapers saying face off, incursion, and when the public reads it, they say, wow, this is a problem, and what do we do about it? So I think China and India do need to stabilize their relationship, and they need to remove from the table this problem, this border issue, which uh, has the capacity to derail their relations and derail and not only that it can dangerously um, uh, it can go beyond uh, because right now uh, there are many of us in India who worry uh, that if the PLA is if the Chinese are making such a strong claim on Tawang is it possible that in some future clash that the Chinese might actually move across the border occupy Tawang or try to occupy Tawang could there actually be a localized more intense conflict and as I explained that since the mid 70s there has been no bullet fired but there is always, you have forces there, you have uh, guns there, you have uh, uh, people there. Uh, so the danger of, of, of escalation, of just the uh, local escalation, uh, is also pretty high. I'd like to come in again here on this particular point you just made. Do, do you think there is um, um, enough of an understanding on, on maybe a, in India generally of, of the stakeholding in in the relationship on the Chinese side, you know, it's, it, do you reckon there is enough um, uh, of a granular, um, specific, detailed understanding of, of what, uh, of who, who is doing what on the Chinese side of, of that relationship? And the reason why I ask this, this is because after um, Xi Jinping's visit, um, I think I saw in in the um, commentary coming out from from India specifically. Um, a debate emerging over whether Xi Jinping was was the man who was making the decisions, or or if um, others may be taking decisions which he may or may not be aware of, or aware of, of them with delay. And I think that's an interesting question. Um, and and obviously there's there's a stakeholding, uh, there's a real stakeholding question, but there's also uh, a perception of that stakeholding, which which matters. You're right in the sense that we often tend to assume that uh, the Chinese system work is a mirror of our system. As I, as I explained to you that Mr. Wang Yi is kind of about three ranks below the, the, the people who really run the foreign policy. The, the, the uh, foreign affairs leading small group is the group that, uh, that is uh, involved in foreign policy making where Xi Jinping himself, uh, the members of the uh, Central Military Commission, mm -hmm. So certainly, uh, uh, policy is not certainly not made by the foreign ministry of uh, China. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. But that increasingly so of countries like India as well, where the prime minister and his office are making uh, policy and not uh, at least in very with in key relationships. The second element that is different from India and often not understood too well is the role of the PLA. And as I explained to you that the border defense cooperation agreement uh, on the Chinese side it was signed by Lieutenant General of the PLA now if you look at the MEA website you won't find that but I happen to have the original uh, uh, press release that was there and there it's mentioned and I asked my friend uh, in the MEA I said how many of these old agreements were signed by the PLA guy and I haven't yet got an answer so which means the, uh, uh, the, the there is the, I wouldn't say disconnect but let's say the PLA has certain responsibilities in the Chinese uh, view of things, uh, of border management, which the PLA handles itself. Like in, in the Indian case, uh, because of the way our bureaucracies function, uh, border management right in front is the Indo Tibetan Border Police, which reports to the Home Ministry. And uh, all, external, uh, all external relationships are handled by the Ministry of External Affairs. So the military, uh, our military doesn't come into the picture. So even this BDCA, the Indian signatory was the civilian uh, Ministry of Defense official. So yes, the, uh, the, the differences exist, but 
to answer your question, I'd say I'm not sure uh, how uh, sophisticated that understanding is. For example, even this whole business of leading small groups, it's only now that we are getting some kind of an idea that, you know, how it uh, because they are leading small groups in a whole range of areas. And <coughs> for quite some time, we didn't even know uh, who were the members of the leading small groups. But only, I think, uh, four or five months ago, uh, one of the Chinese papers published the uh, list of different people and the different uh, leading small groups. And it was surprising to find that Xi Jinping also uh, headed the cyber leading small group. You know, now so often this is not understood uh, by others, uh, and uh, it is an important thing to understand that when you when you negotiate with the Chinese. Great, thank you. Um, unless there are other questions, I, I'd like to just ask uh, one last one of, of my own, and that is to do with um, military to military relations. Um, one thing which has taken place since we um, since we spoke about the um, the September visit and the uh, Chuma incident is that there was a very successful um, counterterrorism um, uh, exercise which took place in uh, the city of Pune and um, and uh, a very sizable and, and fairly high level um, uh, Chinese contingent um, attended that exercise. Um, very obviously, this. Um, came against a backdrop which is which is a complicated backdrop. Um, do you, do you see military to military relations being uh, somewhat insulated um, of of the border incident or the border um, issue generally, or, or do you see would you see a situation or or, or, or a, a, a convergence of circumstances which could lead to um, a more substantive um, um, uh, interruption or even a breakdown in, in, in that, that, that relationship? You know, we already have fairly uh, good relationship. We have these border meetings of our uh, pretty senior officers uh, at designated spots on the uh, uh, border. And in these meetings, there's a lot of bonhomie. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the Republic Day or China's National Day, you have these meetings and uh, people are, uh, have a good time, they have a party up in these godforsaken uh, areas. But uh, now we're trying to step up that as to these kind of exchanges. For example, the CT uh, uh, training, mm -hmm. also an understanding. And this May, I was uh, in China wearing my journalist hat and they took us to a helicopter base. They took us to the Shanghai Naval Garrison. Uh, they gave us a very high level briefing at the Beijing by the Ministry of Defense, uh, Yang Yujun, who is the spokesperson. They answered all questions uh, fairly. And so the, the impression I got was the PLA was also increasing sophistication of the PLA in reaching out. Now, this is different in India because in India what happens is that the Indian, uh, the Indian military uh, functions under a civilian bureaucratic and, uh, you know, system. And so they do not have that level of flexibility. Whereas the PLA is much more influential uh, within the Chinese system. The PLA is a much more influential entity than the Indian military is within the Indian uh, system. So this, this, these are kind of basic differences that, that, that um, uh, exist. Uh, but I am impressed by the fact that the, uh, the, the uh, beyond that, and I know that Indian generals, I have briefed, uh, I had occasion to brief uh, uh, an Indian chief, army chief who went uh, uh, to China, uh, advised him on this back in the 90s. And uh, so we've had good exchanges with the, with the Chinese. And I think we'll have more because, you know, when, when it comes to military to military, there is a certain, uh, there is a certain, um, what should I say, bonhomie that arises out of the, the, the uniform fraternity. They talk each other's language in a way, even they may be divided by a language, but they are able to speak to each other, discuss issues uh, in, in, in at a different level, meaning whether it's a, a ship that you're visiting and the missiles or the stuff like that. And, you know, uh, one of members of my delegation was an army general in, uh, who works with a publication and, and he was asking questions and, uh, you know, uh, they were very happy, the Chinese were very happy to deal with them. Great. Uh, I think uh, uh, Richard Bridge from BP. Um, I just wondered if there's a, a read across uh, from what's happening in uh, other uh, other parts of China's foreign relations, uh, particularly its relations, the way that Xi Jinping is handling relations with Japan uh, or with uh, countries on the South China Sea. 
does uh, the, the the kind of um, do developments in that relationship handling make you uh, more positive about the possibility of there being an agreement, a final agreement with with India, uh, or less? Is there, is there a, does it does it illuminate? You know, I have a feeling, and this is go by going through the recent outcome of the Central Work uh, Foreign Affairs Work Conference, which took place on 28th and 29th in Beijing. Uh, I think the Chinese have realized that their assertiveness has created a backlash. A. B. The Chinese are also wondering why they, with uh, the economic power, do not have more friends than they have. You know, uh, so I think um, I de what I detect is a change style in Beijing. Uh, Xi Jinping's speech right through was uh, emphasizing the, the, the fact that we need innovative solutions, uh, innovative diplomatic solutions to deal with our, um, with our, with our, with our problems. And uh, I think that what the Chinese are doing is that they are taking half a step back uh, on, on some of these issues. And uh, given, and I, as I listed the statements that Xi Jinping himself had made on, on the border issue, wanting so there are some parts of the system which seem to seem to realize that uh, we can't go on like this and we need to resolve this in the same pattern you see uh, if you look at xi jinping's performance at uh, apec uh, at, at the apec summit his speech to the apec ceos uh, meeting what he was emphasizing was look we are a big economic power we are going to there's going to be we are going to invest outward investment will be 10 trillion or 1.4 trillion in the next uh, 10 years our trade will be 10 trillion uh, with 500 million chinese tourists will be going out we are investing 40 billion dollars in the uh, uh, in the uh, silk route uh, uh, initiative basically what he is saying is that you know we are looking for partners we are looking for uh, for for uh, countries to invest in uh, we want a different kind of a relationship we want a relationship which what you know in the chinese phrase when they use win win relationship so i think there is a and, and if you see that this was the same point where he met with shinju abe as well and he also had a meeting with uh, with uh, president obama where they signed two military cbms uh, on on uh, you know trying to uh, trying to control the the um, uh, possibility of clash between you know us naval and uh, aerial uh, uh, assets so i think there there is there is um, some kind of uh, thinking there uh, going on but china is a difficult country you know to if someone to definitively say that this is the direction it's moving but just reading the tea leaves from uh, some of the recent meetings uh, I would suspect that uh, they would be uh, amenable uh, to a settlement, but I think a lot would depend on when they look at India and they see just how successful Mr. Modi is going to be in his reform process. If India is going to be, uh, if India is going to be taking off, and India is on the cusp of that, in, all that in, India has to fix its own problems. And if India, if Mr. Modi in the next couple of months fixes, or next year or two fixes many of the problems, Indian economy is going to be growing faster than Chinese economy. That is a fact. That's a, uh, that's a systemic issue. Because the Chinese economy is a much more, much bigger economy. So for it to keep, it cannot anymore grow at that pace it was growing uh, in the past. So the Indian economy is, going to, is the one that's going to be uh, on the growth path. Now, if that is uh, going to be happening, you'd want uh, a win-win situation there, meaning you'd want uh, Chinese. Uh, want, uh, uh, Chinese have built all the railroads they want in China. They need other places to build railroads too. So they're thinking of fantastic schemes: railroad to Madrid, railroad to South Africa. You know, but uh, the more practical stuff is where you can actually earn money. Is countries like India, which have a backward railway system, where you need high-speed rail and where you can invest. And um, uh, so, so I think that kind of sense of mutuality, mutual advantage uh, of uh, economic cooperation, because the Chinese realize that if you, you know, I, this, this is a no-brainer in the sense that if there is tension on the border, if there are difficulties with India, uh, India goes closer to the United States, uh, Japan, uh, Australia. If there is disruption uh, around, uh, who are the losers? It's the Chinese. 
uh, of course we'll also lose but we have less to lose than the chinese have. so uh, uh, so i think there is an understanding uh, of that and it, and uh, what mr shi is trying to do uh, is basically uh, he, he's got many balls up in the air and uh, as far as the indian ball is concerned it's a, it's an important ball i d- i don't think he wants to let it go certainly not um, by inadvertently great well thank you i'm afraid the time is up um that was a tremendous tour de raison um both in detail and and in breadth um so would you please like to join me in thanking um manoj um for a very thank you